You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello and welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast, the final episode of 2020. What a strange year it's been. I think we're going to sit down and review the year as a whole, but not in chronological order because that wouldn't be the Claret and Blue podcast. There's no point saying the first half was rubbish, the second half was good. So I've got a few awards to give out, best player, best goal, things like that. Before we get into the the meat and bones of the um, of the podcast, first of all, Matt, it's been a weird year, hasn't it? How would you sum it up in terms of, uh, of a Villa perspective? <laughs> Cliche alert, it's, um, it's a year of two halves, isn't it? It's just um, unrecognisable, the, 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 two, the two halves. And, you know, I don't want to make light of this horrible disease that's kind of disrupted the, the planet and, and claimed, claimed a lot of lives this year. But Villa, strangely, are the kind of beneficiaries of it because that, that kind of mini break that was enforced on them earlier in the year just seems to have kind of transformed, giving the club chance to, to take a breath um, to, to have some respite and to and to just reassess and haven't really looked back. You know, I know it was a bit um, a bit a bit tense, shall we say, during Project Restart. Villa just about clinging on to their Premier League status, but since then it's just been it's just been remarkable. Uh, and we're looking forward to 2021 with much more optimism than any of us could have could have really imagined. It's been an odd year, but looking back at it, I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, we can look back and say in 2020, we saw some of the best Aston Villa performances. You know, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here when I say in history, when you see the, their importance to kind of what's happening right now. And I know we do have like a bias on, you know, a recency bias, but... When I look back at the the semi final against Leicester and how kind of heroic that performance was, when I look back at um, the the Watford win as well, you know, and the Arsenal win after lockdown, there was there was a lot of really really tough performances, even in the, the worst bit of uh, Villa's twenty twenty. But you know, you look back at in the new season, the players we brought in, someone like Ross Barkley that that's playing at Villa now. Some of the performances we put in, you don't, you don't even have to say the seven two. You can go to the Arsenal win, even the, the Chelsea draw yesterday, or you know the the, the Boxing Day win. Villa have put in some massive performances recently, and twenty twenty on the large, pretty positive. And you know, again, we can't ignore what Matt said. A, a large part of that is down to the refocus that you know the 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 lockdown period when when Villa refocused and they had their own little kind of backs against the wall training camp when they all got together and you know it was like a siege siege mentality that us against the world and you know that is probably the only kind of highlight of what that that this is that's the only way it's positively benefited benefited Villa because of course we've many Villa fans would have lost their lives uh, so yeah it has been a, a real downer of a year um, we've not been able to enjoy this football in person the last match I went to I think was the Carabao Cup final so 90,000 fans all around you to, to nothing and you know wondering when football will come back at all um, but yeah on the large it looks like we're probably coming out of this in a, a better place for us all really so fingers crossed 2020 felt like, felt like two or three different seasons rolled into one Villa from January to March were awful and then the project restart feels like another season. I know there is two seasons because obviously we've started a new one now. But Villa are excellent again now. When you when you said earlier, James, about you thinking back to the Watford week where we beat Watford and Leicester in the same week, those two last minute winners, which I think we'll come on to later when we get to our favourite moments and best goals and things like that. I know they're certainly one of my contenders. That feels like two or three years ago to me. That feels like a long time ago since Villa were doing things like that. So to kind of review the year as a whole is difficult because it's been such a whirlwind of, of moments and events. It does feel like a very, very long year. I feel like I've gone from being a theatre-goer to being a cinema-goer, really. Ollie Watkins, to me, is just a film star. Never seen him in the flesh. Don't know what... You know, Christian Menteke was was your kind of star who used to tread the boards. You could actually be there and, and you know, take part and see them. So it, it, it's bizarre that we've all, all had to come up with new habits to watch football. Um, I wonder, listen, Villa, Villa had a, a super dramatic end to last season and a super emphatic start to this season. I wonder what it's like watching football like this when your team's a little bit meh. Do you know what I mean? It, at least yeah. we've been out. It's been kind of box office for Villa because it's been exciting. There's always been something on it. I'd hate to watch a, a season of kind of mid-table mediocrity um, behind closed doors. You just switch over, wouldn't you, and put Emmerdale on. Uh, but at least Villa, Villa have kept us kind of kept us fascinated and kept us entertained just by just by turning 2020 on the pitch into 
the most kind of bizarre, random roller coaster of football that probably we witnessed at Villa for for a decade or more. Before we get onto our little awards segment, do you think it's f- safe to say that the the lockdown saved Villa from relegation, saved Dean Smith from, from losing his job? Do you think if, if we'd have played another two or three games in in late March, early April, that that we'd have lost a couple, and Dean Smith might have lost his job? Yeah. <laughs> we'd have went down um, I think the last game played before the lockdown was Villa versus Leicester that really uh, I think I wrote it down as like a 5-0 it felt like a 5-0 I can't even remember the scoreline but it was it was much lower than that but it was an absolutely disastrous performance you know in all aspects I remember Pepe, Pepe Reina coming out miles out, out of the goal and that's meant to be your leader you look at Martinez now and the leadership there and, and even when Tyron Mings is looking around to organise it there was nothing it was sinking the, pro, the, the, the faith had gone there was no faith in the project anymore it, you know the, the players you know as us as fans probably couldn't see much past where Villa were heading and that seemed to be in one direction and relegation so I don't know how the, the players would have reacted on it and they needed that break they needed that massive pause to, to completely reset you know rediscover and, and, and reforge new expectations because there was only one way that Villa were heading I mean I mean they could have still put on a heroic fight back we, we will never know that, that, that reality's gone um, but you know, the, from the way form hat works in the Premier League and the way results happen, you, you sometimes you just can't. As teams will know now, you can't just buy you can't buy a win sometimes. And, and Villa were looking like that, so they, I think that lockdown did save Villa. I mean, people will go onto that kind of VAR mishap at um, the, the goal line stuff, and you know, even though it happened in in the first half of a football match, and there's still 45 minutes to play, people look at that as the point that saved Villa, not the the win against Palace and Arsenal and the, the draws and, you know, the points picked up um, after that match. I, I look at that and for right, right or wrong, that will, you know, define Villa's 2020, I guess. So who knows? It's weird doing this podcast because obviously we've all had a bit of time off over Christmas. I don't know what day it is at the moment. I don't know what date it is. We're in that weird <laughs> moment between Christmas and New Year. I've got a cider with me. I've even got a bit of a cheese board on the go that I'm waiting to finish this podcast to get back to. So this is weird to try and think back on the year anyway, because I don't really even know what day it is. Never mind remembering specific moments of Villa's history, uh, 2020 history. So we'll move on to our awards, first of all. And the first one's an obvious one, Player of the Year. And we've done a Player of the Year lately. We've, we've talked about plenty of on, on the podcast, on social media. People have seen Jack Grealish, Trezeguet, Tara Mings, and one other that I've definitely forgot, Douglas Louise, we're in the running for that. Jack Grealish won by a landslide. It's very obvious to sit here and say that Jack Grealish is Villa's player of 2020. My question is, if we were given an award to the player of the year that isn't Jack Grealish, who would you pick? So Jack Grealish in the fans football of the year came second, which is, you know, thank you to everyone who voted because I think if that went uh, an extra two or days longer, he would have won, he would have beat Mo Salah and been the, the player of the, the year for 2020 um, nationally. So, you know, that, that's a massive thing. So, you know, it's got to be Jack Grealish, but of course we're here to give it to someone else. Um, the whole 2020, <sighs> some big names, man. Um, I could go Tyro Mings, but I feel like I would need a long time to explain my reasons why and the reasons are very specific to me and, being able to view a match in person so i don't really want to pick that because it needs it's, there's a lot of caveats to it if you know what i mean even though it, you, you would be deserving but i'm gonna pick emiliano martinez because i think he has completely changed us and villas you know from a goalkeeping perspective we thought we were on a good thing with tom heaton martinez has changed that completely um putting up some massive saves looks commanding even when mings is out there's an organizer at the back uh, which is so so, so important uh, martinez hasn't put a foot wrong i don't think at villa maybe a slip up against uh, a fulham Pfft, there's an argument that some people think he could have done better against southampton i can't see it but you know any game where villa have been in it, in it it's been, been larger but if it's been competitive it's been, been because of martinez and the stuff he does every single game even the basics fantastic goalkeeper um there's plenty deserving i think john mcginn could have an argument for his form even our moral guys he could be someone you look at um treasure guy coming back douglas louise for his um lock lockdown performances and then into the new season I'm going to have to go for Martinez but you know you could probably give it to a, a, a fair few other players um, absolutely commendable from the whole team what do you think Matt? Probably Douglas Louise. Just he's so cool isn't he? Hmm. Just make, you know, he's just who wouldn't want to be Douglas Louise? he's so Brazilian um, I think he was one of the ones who probably you know, there's a big spending spree in the summer of 2019 and we raved about people and then we lost faith in people as the results started to slip. And perhaps Douglas Louise was one of the ones who were thinking, is he that good? Is he the real deal? Did Man City let him go for, for a reason? Um, and then 
out of out of nowhere when Villa needed somebody to help galvanise them. Um, he was the man. He was the man who came came along in our hour of need. And I just like the fact that for somebody who does the kind of dirty part of the game, does the horrible, horrible sporting part of the game, a lot of it, he still seems to do that with a certain degree of grace and swagger. Um, you know, we hear a lot about that, how, how hard he's been, been working to, to learn English. Um, Ash was saying that he was uh, he's starting to acclimatise the British weather and was out on the Stamford Bridge pitch. Um, you know, when everybody was looking at the, you know, everybody was checking out the pitch before the game. He got his shorts on and didn't, you know, didn't let the, the biting kind of um, British winter bother him. I just think he's been he's been a revelation and he's been certainly the, the back end of 2020, um, June, July onwards. He's been the player that um, that we hoped he'd be, really. And, you know, if everybody gets nervous, don't they, when they see this um, buyback clause with Manchester City. Um, hopefully, hopefully Villa can, can continue to kind of, I don't know, keep, keep with the ambitions of the better players that, that we've got really. Uh, and I definitely think Douglas Louise is one of the better players. We know Grealish has kind of walked this award in terms of Villa's player of the year 2020, but Grealish probably had his lull, if we're being honest, during the, the restart. Um, you know, I know he, he still came good and, and, and scored the goal at West Ham that ultimately kept Villa up. Uh, but Douglas Louise was was the man who stood up to be counted um, when we most needed him. So he gets my vote just ahead of. Um... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It, was, it was. I'll stop rattling in a minute. But it was. It was weird to kind of because it's been like I said. Cause it's been this long, convoluted, elongated year. It's difficult, isn't it? Because people, with the exception of Grealish, people have kind of played in in brief spells rather than played consistently. Um, but yeah, uh, I think he's a I think he's a worthy he's a worthy a worthy um, runner up in the silver medal places. The next award is titled the Comeback Player. Now, I've got a, I've got two nominations for this, but I'm interested to hear your two th- first. So, Matt, I'll let you go first this time, in a less rattly answer, please, if you don't mind. The comeback player. Um, mm-hmm. Does it have to be somebody who's played? Can it be Gareth Barry? Because, A, I want him to come back, <laughs> and, B, he did come back and he spoke to us and told us the story of, um, story of his Aston Villa career. So, he's the one, one player that's left in, in the last, well, probably, probably in my, in my Villa support in lifetime, um, who I really, really would have loved to have see come back, um, <laughs> back to Villa Park. <laughs> is that, is that a contrived interpretation? Not the, even the right, right, not even direction for the answer. <laughs> who's had a what, better what, year? What, what, somebody, somebody who we wrote off who's actually come good? Yeah. Do you want me to speak for another five minutes about Douglas Louise? <laughs> <laughs> is that what you, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, Douglas so Louise. Who's bounced, who's bounced back? Who's come back from like from an injury to be even better? Who has been written off? Who, who's come good? Do you want my two answers? Yeah, go go to Dan because Matt's just he's gone. So my two answers or my two options are Trezeguet first of all, and he's a personal comeback story because I definitely wrote him off at one stage and I thought, oh, he's not good enough and we'll replace him at some point and that'll be that. But he con- contributed some big goals during the project restart and he's, until his uh, recent injury, kept Burton Shaw out, hit the, the new right winger signing out of the side. So that, to me, is a comeback story. My second option is John McGinn. And he's not a comeback player as in resurrected from, from mm-hmm. the doldrums of Villa Park and now he's, he's some amazing player. We knew how good he was anyway. But, we didn't see him for the first part of 2020. And when he did come back, back back in Project Restart, he wasn't ready. We're only now seeing in the last four or five fixtures just how good he is and that he's back to his best. So that's that's a secondary comeback story. We knew he was good. It's just nice to see him back in there. I wouldn't be able to pick between the two because they're, they're both included for different reasons, but they're my answers. James, I suppose this was your award, so maybe you should crown it and we'll just keep my out of this one. Yeah, I just kind of picked it off. I was going through a sports awards that you give to teams and I think the NFL have this. And it's usually given to someone who's had like a, an awful injury, like, like Wesley, and then comes back and does really well and everyone's like, wow, you did amazing. I guess it's only like really 
like Amwar Al Ghazi you could pick for this. Sorry about the award, but yeah, it's just going to be Al Ghazi, isn't it? Because written off, he, he could be on loan at wherever, Trabs on Spore, whomever now, and just kicking about. And, you know, no one is really paying attention to him anymore, but, you know, he's on the up. He's been massively on the up, and you could say, yeah, it's a, a bit of a hot streak for him at the moment. He's, he's playing in good form, but it's been marvellous form, really helped Villa the last few games. And, you know, he's, he's almost made every single game just about himself. Like, even the, the Wolves penalty, how many chances he's had against Burnley, scores first against West Brom, then bags the penalty, could have had a hat trick. Marvellous against Crystal Palace, ripping him open and his finish at the end. And uh, pretty much the same again against uh, Chelsea. Just always a threat, always making it about, about himself. When you consider how, you know, kind of pushed down his personality was, how kind of he wasn't really a side character when he was just making cameos in the cups and not even, you know, doing brilliantly there. So considering that he's someone who's deleted his tweet because of how, deleted his Twitter because of um, mm. how everyone treated him after missing against Everton and how he's kind of repaid that it's fantastic you know can't speak highly of him enough i think he's carried himself brilliantly excellently you know what a character so he gets it from me i think that's a satisfactory answer when we move on to the next round to be honest the next category i'm going to give you this one max i think you and me might agree on the same player here this category is called the underrated player now james you just spoke about al ghazi i think al ghazi could possibly have come in as, as underrated here but he wasn't my first pick so I'll let you take this one, Matt, and hope that we've said the same person. Oh, I've got no idea. You go first, and then I'll see if I agree with you. <laughs> okay, I think Matty Target is Villa's most underrated player. Now, he might not have had the best first half to 2020, but did any Villa player have a great first half to 2020? This season, though, I think he's been very, very good, particularly in the last few games. I find myself more and more going, of course, that was Matt Target. That was, that was a great last-ditch last, last ditch tackle, a great block, whatever it is. And I think he's gets a lot of unfair stick. And yeah, he's not the, the most brilliant player in the world, but I think he's a very steady left back for for the Premier League. And I'd say that makes him underrated. I think, and you're going to okay. laugh me out there, I think Jack Grealish for a lot of this year has probably been Villa's most underrated player in a wider capacity because it's taken the England manager, um, <clears throat> it's taken Jack Grealish to keep Villa up. Single-handedly is a bit much, but, you know, to, to inspire Villa to, to survival, um, to even get him to, to get a look in. Even when he got a look in and started to shine on the international stage, he was still being written off. Um, but I think there's been a bit of a kind of, um, I don't know, a wind of change or whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. I think people have woken up to him now. Um, I think, like James said, Jack Grealish was runner-up in our company's Player of the Year nationally, just behind Mo Salah. And I think people are actually thinking, you know what? It's not just Villa fans overhyping this kid. He can actually, you know, we wrote him off when he was doing it against Championship defenders, just calling him a flat track bully. Uh, and then we said it was a fluke when he did it, you know, in the Premier League. But now, not only is he doing it in the Premier League again with goals and assists, but he's doing it on the international stage as well. So, as ridiculous as it, as it sounds, I think Jack Grealish has been Villa's most underrated player for the bulk of 2020. Not anymore. I don't think. I don't think even his kind of yeah. fiercest critics can dare to ignore him anymore because they realise that he's the real deal. That's I Very think good that's, answer. That's I'm impressed by that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> the one. I think uh, recently, I think Ty, like I know we mentioned him in the last one, but Tyrone Mings kind of comes back into consideration because I think when he did do something really stupid against Crystal Palace, but you know you have got people calling him, you know, saying that he's not an in England international. You know, he's a Championship right defender. You know, Tyra Mings does so much for Aston Villa. I mean, yeah, they're, they're rather casual mistakes that seem to always be coming. Um, but the organisation, the leadership, and people pick that and say, yeah, he shouts a lot, but that, this and that, you know, that's all he brings. He brings so, you know, the character of Tyra Mings is the character of Aston Villa. Aston Villa are a certain, they've got a certain mentality, and that's portrayed probably best by Tyra Mings. But I think Matt's answer, your answer, Matt Target's brilliant, but. Jack really is, is the one Villa quietly had a world class player in their team, and it's, I think it took us all, or even Villa fans, a long time to realise that we all thought we all knew he was brilliant. Just how brilliant can he be? Because if you look at the start of last season, people going, "Oh, McGinn's acted uh, adapted really well to the Premier League." Jack Grealish hasn't, and man's went from strength to strength. He's been br utterly brilliant. The, the pass he did against Crystal Palace, you know, if, if Ronaldo and Messi are doing that, you know, you're never really end of it. He's done that for Aston Villa in a tough game. That wherever a man down against a similar calibre type, or should be a similar calibre type of team in Crystal Palace, with Villa's second second season from being in the Championship. So, for me, it's, it's 
Matt's bang on. Good stuff. Very happy with that answer. We'll move on to our next category. This should be a as much as they've all been good signings, I feel like there's one standout here more so than the other. This is category's best signing. Now, I don't think any of the January 2021s will make anyone's shortlist here. It's obviously the summer of 2020 that we're all going to be talking about. There's one standout name for me, and that's Emmy Martinez as being the best signing, not only for Villa. I think he's one of, one of the best signings of the Premier League this year. Do you have a best signing for Villa, you two? Just to be different, I'll go the other end of the pitch and go for go for Ollie Watkins um, because... To come in to, you know, he's gone. I like footballers who, who take the scenic route to the Premier League, and he's done that. Uh, I think it makes makes people, listen, it's a bit of a sweeping generalisation, but I think it makes people more rounded and individuals and gives them a wider appreciation of life uh, rather than just kind of being born with a, a Premier League silver spoon in the mouth. And I think Watkins epitomises that. Um, it just seems to be, he seems to be loving the ride. You know, he, he, he got hit the goal trail fairly, fairly early, fairly spectacularly. Um, you know, to, to score a hat trick against, against the champions at Villa Park. You know, I just feel, I feel a little bit for him and for the, all the other new signings that they haven't really, they haven't had chance to experience the whole end and Villa Park um, packed to the rafters because I think that's what's missing. That's the acclaim. That, that, that you know their performances deserve. Um, Watkins has got a bit of everything for me. You know he can look after himself physically. He's got the he's got the intelligence to to make runs that only him and Jack really know <laughs> are possible. Um, and he can score goals. He is unselfish. He can do defensive work either from chasing from the front. He can defend set pieces in his own box. He's strong in the air. He's fast. Um, you know, I sound like his agent here, but he's to me is the most exciting centre forward. You know, I, I think that I, I wouldn't want to say because I think I think his p- potential knows no bounds, really. Because who Villa centre forwards been in in recent years? The ones that we've adored. You're probably talking about Big John Carew, um, and you're talking about Christian Benteke, and. I know the, the Wally Watkins is still only what 23, 24, but I think he's potentially got more more tools in his toolbox than than some of the big big kind of heroes that we've had down the years. So, uh, and he seems like a thoroughly nice bloke, and I want to be back in Villa Park so I can shout nice things at him. If we were like ten years ago, this is how far the Premier League's come on. That player of Wally Watkins's caliber would have been pacing up for up forward for Arsenal in the Champions League ten years ago. They were in the Champions League ten years ago. You know, that's how far Villa have come. You know, the standard of player we now have and you know that has been developed in the championship is incredible. Matty Cash as well signing you know, recent summer signing. I'd I'd love to I'd have loved Courtney Hawes and Esri Conta to wait a bit before joining Villa because either one of them would have been an absolute shoe in for this. Um, but I'm going to be like Dan and go for Emmy Martinez because he's you know, changed the game for us at goalkeeper. Changed my expectations of even what a goalkeeper could do at Aston Villa. Probably been one of our best in recent years, especially. I don't think anyone comes particularly close. Even Tom Heaton, as fantastic as he was, uh, Martinez has stepped up the next category is best performance of the year now I'm just going to say Villa 7 Liverpool 2 and sit back that's fun Liverpool that's it's a great one you know I was speaking to my dad earlier about it and he said the only problem is when Liverpool put in 7 against Palace and that that you're thinking you know how how good how good are that Villa team and how normalised that 7-2 is now I don't know I, I could go back and say Villa versus Watford I really could um, because when the chips are down, you know, Dean Smith, Villa side seems to just turn up and really give in like, uh, you know, a performance for the ages. How many good, I'll go back to the start of the podcast, how many good performances have Villa put in this, this year, not season, sorry, this year, you know, Leicester uh, in the, in the cup semifinals, uh, Watford, even the Brighton one, like it, it probably isn't and the Arsenal win, both Arsenal wins. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, I think the Liverpool one, cause it's just abs- an absolute shock, like genuinely, like, you know, you thought it won't happen again. And Villa have put in good performances all season. It was a horror night for Liverpool. We, we, we shouldn't get out of the wrong. It was a horrific performance, but Villa ripped them apart. You know, you can only play the team you play against, Matt. So I can't join uh, Dan here and go for Liverpool. Yeah, it's a bit like the um, Villa's player of the year that isn't Jack Grealish. 
you know, you, you can't you can't look beyond that performance, can you? And you know, in before my time, when when Villa battered uh, Liverpool five one back in the seventies, you hear you hear older men than me saying what a night it was, what a fantastic what a fantastic night it was. It'll never be bettered. Then you know, Villa go and smash the champions seven two. Um, it was a it was a crazy crazy night, wasn't it? Um, and I think it was just fate. It was just destined to be. You know, things were deflecting in all over the shop, um, which I took great delight in. Um, but Villa were Villa were good value for that. They could have scored more. Could have scored more goals that night. Uh, so I think it'll be many years before Villa produce such a kind of an amazing, astonishing. Um, demolition of one of the world's best teams. Let's not forget. Um, I don't think we'll see the like for for a long, long time. So, you know, if somebody else, you know, if, if somebody can vote in a performance over that, then Christ, I'd like to, I'd like to witness what it is. Oh, well, I think the reason I say like like Watford is because I was, you were there. You could, you felt every second of that. And Liverpool's very good, and that's still my vote, but. And you have to vote for it. You can't not vote for it. Um, but not being there hurt like is a, is a pain when you, when you consider how kind of pitiful the Watford result is in, in respect. You, you're desperately beating. You're desperately getting points there against you know a relegation rival in the, in the worst possible circumstances. Whereas Liverpool, you, you you've played and you got the deflections. You got lucky a few times, yeah. But you've played the best team in the world off the park off, at Villa Park as well. So. Fantastic. Do you think it actually happened? Do you think it was like the fake moon landings? Ah, it's the Truman Show. I wonder. It's like the Truman Show or something. Um, but yeah, we asked the question, didn't we, at the time, or I asked the question on social media, would people rather have won one nil and been there or, you know, as it was, won 7-2 and, and not been there? And people were kind of, you know, emphatically saying, oh, 7-2, you never see the likes of this again. I'd have had the one nil. <laughs> Not such a bore. It's part of it, isn't it? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's audience participation, isn't it? The next category, also one that's easier to, to remember, something where you were there for, um, best goal of 2020. Now, again, I'm, I'm like I said at the start, I don't know what date it is. I'm very, I'm filling this podcast with recency bias. I'm picking everything from this season because I can't remember half of last season, to be honest. It was all a blur. And you can either take this two roads, you can either take it as the best goal in terms of technique and quality, something to look at, or best goal in terms of most important. I think if I was picking most important, Jack's goal against West Ham on the last day to keep us up. Best goal, I watched through a couple before we came on, and I wanted to say all three at Arsenal is my answer. I know it's not specifically one goal, but every goal against Arsenal was such high quality, even with the McGinn effort that was ruled out for that bark off side that I'm still not over. We outplayed Arsenal that day, and every goal was of such a high standard that made everyone look at Villa in a different way and go, Christ, Villa are actually very good now. So I can't really pick any of those. Watkins header in that was great. The first goal, I think Trezeguet at the back post it was a nice build up player from pretty much the whole the whole side so I'm going to say my best goal of the year is the three against Arsenal <laughs> Oof, I think uh, Grealish at Brighton was a, that was a great goal and that was right at the start of the year as well so he had a, a lot to compete with I'm also yeah. I'm really inclined to go for one or, one or two of Bertrand Traore's goals so the one against West Brom is probably the classiest finish you'll ever see but the one in the the, the League Cup against Bristol City that was a that was a cracking finish I think I think I'm inclined to go for that, but I think the one that kind of got the biggest rise, the most important, one of the more important ones, even though it's a cup, the the kind of context of it. I think Trezeguet uh, against Leicester City in the, the cup semi final for me. I think it's just it was just a defining Villa goal. So like everything they try and do is always that back post to Trezeguet. I'm a Hamadi to uh, Trezeguet, and it it works. It, it seems to work every time. Um, but that one was it was cracking. It, it ripped the roof off the place. Fantastic. Uh, wasn't no kind of Jackie Grealish long range kind of dipping volley. It wasn't uh, the result of a fantastic finish or a dribble. But I think it was such a such an Aston Villa goal. So I'll go for Trezeguet in the uh, the semi cup the semi final. I think I'd go for the one Ollie Watkins scored against um, scored against Crystal Palace because it, it, it hit the post. Lovely reverse ball from, from Jack Grealish and it hit the post. So that, that's actually hitting the target. It hit the post. <laughs> so I'm going to sign that. that oh. No, I'm going to go for a real scrappy one. It wasn't the most aste- aesthetically pleasing. Um, 
But just that goal against Watford, Toro, Toro Mings, that Conta <laughs> thought he'd scored the winner. It was such a frustrating game, and Watford, you know, Ben Foster took an age tying his laces all game, and Martin Atkinson didn't really punish them for, for time wasting. And Villa Park was getting more and more impatient and desperate to win. And then just gone, they've gone and spawned um, that goal, and it was just um, the 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 roof came off Villa Park. It just exploded, um, and I think not only not only was it such a, did it prove to be such an important win um, over the course of the season. But just poor, poor Esri Konza when the when the bloke from Sky tells him that it's not his goal, um, it's made made one of my made made one of the most um, amusing memes um, of 2020. Just that kind of crushing. Crush, well, he's still he's still obviously delighted, but that kind of crushing dis- disappointment that it's not his goal. Uh, it's not going to win any beauty beauty pageants that goal. Uh, but again, it probably just feeds back into. We were there. We've not. We've not been there to 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 enjoy that many moments, and that was a special one. That's a good answer there, and it leads perfectly into the next the next uh, category, which is a great segue that you're talking about best moments, <laughs> best moment of 2020. Now I'm going to go exactly what you were just talking about there, and the last one I was at, which was Aston Villa two, Leicester City one in the Carabao Cup semi final. You've just said about it, the goal, James, the atmosphere that we saw. Or if, to say, even that week as a whole for best moment, the Watford game, I think, was the Tuesday. And then the following Tuesday, I think, was, was Leicester in the Cup. Two last-minute goals, two last-minute winners. That was the last game I went to at Villa Park, the Leicester game. I think it was the 28th of January, 2019. I've not been to Villa Park since. I missed the Tottenham game through through illness. The Cup final was at Wembley, obviously, which was great, but different. So the last win I saw and the last game I saw at Villa Park was January. We're releasing this podcast possibly New Year's Eve. We're about to head into 2021 and I've not been to a game for almost 12 months. If you told me that back then when I'd just seen a last minute winner going, I'd go, what, what are you talking about? That's mental. And I think if I look back and there's probably a little bit of almost nostalgia. And you think nostalgia is something that you reference with something long ago, something that's, that's old. This is a year ago, pretty much, that that happened. That was the last time I was at Villa Park. Yeah. And that's why that's that my kind of highlight or best moment of 2020. For me, I think last match I went to was the, with fans, was the Carabao Cup final, I think, maybe. You know, a cup final at Wembley. We've had a few now. We've been quite lucky at Villa, haven't we? We've had a few, even if you go over the last decade, the League Cup final, um, the FA Cup final and the playoff final and then another League Cup final. Um, we've been pretty privileged through that, even though there's not been many brilliant victories there. Um, but we came so close to winning that League Cup as well, like so close to just dragging it to penalties. And you know, when when we hit the post, and it's just that was a very complete Villa experience for me because it was a humility and defeat that usually comes with being a Villa fan and kind of celebrating, even though you you lost and it was a tough game against Man City. Kind of that never say die from Villa came through, and I think probably that the the fruit that would um. The, the seed that would then fruit in the, uh, after lockdown because they all huddled in the middle of the pitch, had a word of themselves, and they got battered by Leicester. But after that, when we had lockdown, they came back a, a different team. So you kind of s- sort of start a bit there. Um, but yeah, that Carabao Cup final for me, I know avoiding relegation, beating Liverpool, be bigger and better moments. But the last game I went to was a, the complete Villa experience, even with a loss as well, a typical Villa loss. My moment would be when... Jack Grealish not only turned up to sign his new contract and kind of put us out of our misery, but took his dog with him. I just thought, <laughs> you know, as if as if the smiling Jack Grealish wasn't enough, wasn't enough of a kind of an iconic image. Uh, after all that speculation had gone away, our hero, our saviour, uh, one of our own, had you know placed his future for another five years to do it with such an adorable pooch in tow as well it was just i don't know just it just kind of real good feel good factor um so i think it'd be that we've spoken about him enough and podcasts throughout the course of 2020 and prior to that but for him to commit his future to aston villa it was actually a kind of even then we didn't think it was a precursor to the the, the first 13, 14 games of the season that, that have followed, that was beyond our wild, wild extremes. But I think Jack Jack signing that bit of paper um, allowed us to dare to dream. Um, so for me, you know, 
I think that 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 does it for me because it, it said so much about where Villa are at and where where we want to be. Yeah, another great answer. Um, we've got three categories left to go. Two of these, Matt, were your idea, so I'm hoping you've got specific answers lined up here or why you'd want me to ask these because they're very random. So we'll go for the first one. Best tweet. Now, I didn't know how to interpret this one. I wondered whether it was a tweet of our own, a tweet from the podcast, a player's tweet, a club tweet. So I'm going to let you go first. And if my answer doesn't line up with the route you've gone for, I'm just going to pretend I didn't have one. <laughs> I never really... I just... I was watching an episode of Father Ted last night and um, Dougal... I know when you like Father Ted, but Dougal comes up with an idea. Basically, what I'm saying is I had the idea, but I've not come up with... <laughs> Not, not come up with a follow-up idea. So go to James, and when James James starts talking, that'll prompt something, prompt something brilliant in my mind. So my mind's actually from a Leeds fan. Like this is like my my highlight of uh, twenty twenty. Yeah. It was uh, for Villa versus Leeds um, recently, and unfortunately he has dive deleted the photo because he did get harassed and absolutely battered for it by by Leeds fans as well. Uh, but I think he was in, you know, uh, the a uh, kind of luchador mask. I think it may have been the Bane mask as well, a, a luchador wrestling mask, designed to be like Bane from Batman. And he said, uh, "Grealish, you think diving in is your ally? VAR is my ally. I was born in it, molded by it, and that's replacing darkness is my ally. I was born in it. So I was just thinking, he's been born in Stockley yeah. Park. That was my thing. Like the, lad, the poor lad has been born <laughs> and brought up in Stockley Park, just watching." Decision after decision, oh, he's he's got like the rule book nailed on in his head, but it was just the, the wrestling mask as well. It was just like none of this makes any sense, but it makes perfect sense. It's not even a villa tweet; it's just someone just attacking Jack Grealish and going VAR is going to get him. Leeds got us in that match. They they didn't need VAR to get us in that match, but it's just very funny. I just thought it was just the the perfect perfect tweet. I can't think of one. Have you got one? I've got yeah. I went. <laughs> I mean, this, this does nothing for my reputation here. I picked one of my own. I thought that's what it meant. I'll pick one of your own tweets this year. So, oh, this is terrible, isn't it? I might just cut this out if it's too embarrassing. So you mentioned it earlier, the, the Esri Consa meme, when he thinks he's scored and then he's disappointed that he hasn't. So I tweeted on the 19th of October, Villa fans in early July versus Villa fans now, when he's like looking sad yeah, it's, and it's looking good, happy because Villa are actually good. It's good to me. I think I tweeted something on my birthday. Back in May, Dominic Cummins had done his kind of little kind of explanation press conference in, in the Rose Garden at Downing Street. And I put something like, uh, that's probably the worst defence I've seen this year and I watch Aston Villa. And then Tyra, Tyra Mings <laughs> spotted it and uh, said something like, that, that's the biggest load of nonsense I've read all, all, all year and I read Matt Kendrick in Birmingham Mail or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I thought, oh my God. I thought big, big, top, big Ty's going to start owning me on my birthday. And I thought, Christ, where's he going to go? And we managed to smooth it over with a bit, with a bit of bants. Um, so that was that was my kind of tweet of relief. Yeah. Um, but now, I, I think um, Villa Twitter is a, a strange place, isn't it? Don't you think? You know, you type in that AVFC hashtag and mm-hmm. you don't know whether you're going to get somebody who's kind of going to rip your head off and speak nonsense or whether you, you're going to get somebody who, can, you know, a right minded person who completely agrees with you. Um, so, but it's, um, yeah, I, I haven't really thought about that category, so I don't know whether I've waffled enough to, to, to give you an answer. I have to say, you've both redeemed yeah, yourself. Yeah, fine. I'm happy to move on. Back from nothing there, the pair of you. Well done. The next category was also one of yours. I'm really hoping you've got an answer for this, so I struggled to think of one in the five minutes of prep I did before we started. You wrote best quote. Now, I assume this is best quote from <laughs> Dean Smith or best quote in the press, best quote from a player. Now, I can think of one. I haven't got the specific quote in front of me. I will Google it while you talk if you want to go first, Matt. So please tell me you've got a best quote of 2020. I've got a couple. One, I didn't hear it, but I've heard secondhand that he said it last night. Did John McGinn call Anwar El Ghazi? Anwar El Ghazi? Anwar El Ghazi. I think he did. It reminds me of that. Um, that. Thomas Muller clip. Um, get to James. Mate, I'm, str- I'm struggling with these categories. Can we go back to the comeback player? <laughs> I've got a good a good quote. I think, what's it said about, was it on Amazon Prime when uh, Tyron Mings and McGinn, or was it just Mings, said about Al Ghazi, it's like, may your apology be as loud as you disrespect. And I think that that is very key. Yeah, because Mings got it himself, and I, I did tweet it, and I, I think a few Villa fans thought, 
me and my new new position on on kind of punching down at the fan base. But I think it was Matt Scott, the pundit, who said Martinez has done really well, especially considering Mings has been in front of him. I was thinking, not only would Hawes and the cons are getting your team, Arsenal's team, but Mings would as well. And I think a lot there's a there's a lot of inclination to kind of punch down and disrespect the worst performing Villa player or the Villa player that cocks up and makes a mistake. And Al Ghazi got uh, got barrage for it, and you know Henry Lansbury's not going to get a chance to come back and and kind of quote unquote redeem himself himself. Um, but um, the stuff kind of given to Al Ghazi, Mings, any any bad performing considering the year we've had a fantastic year. Um, some of the stuff I've received has been kind of hor- horrific, uh, especially Al Ghazi as well. So saying you know the, the shirt's too too heavy for him he's not a villa player he's not fit to wear it he's not fit to do this no one wants to see him again you know and that's villa all over like if from for me as a villa fan you know you, you protect your players your, your players are, are representatives of your club as our fans and managers we're all i mean a lot some people are getting paid a bit more to uh represent the badge than me matt and yourself are dan but you know that you're all villa like every one of us is villa like you don't get to choose the worst performer and batter them and kick them out of the club, you know, that they are Al Ghazi, Angamor Al Ghazi is an Aston Villa player and one, one we should all be particularly proud of. So, yeah, uh, may your apology, we shouldn't even need an apology in the first place, just don't do it. They're all right, they're villains. I've got an answer, would you like to hear it? Ooh. So my answer, and I'd paraphrased it earlier in my notes, I'd put Dean Smith telling Grealish to go for a beer with him, and I've been Googling it while you've been talking, James. Dean Smith was asked what, what happens with Jack Grealish now after after transfer interest. He says he goes out and gets drunk with me. That's what happens now. Then tomorrow, I'll sit down with him, the owners, and the chief executive. I love that. I remember being at the time thinking, yeah, all this speculation about Grealish. I don't care. I don't want to hear about it. It's what comes out of Villa. Dean Smith, Jack Grealish, and the owners' mouths. And they were true to their words. They went out, had a drink, sat down, signed a new five-year deal with a lovely puppy. And here we are with one of the best players, not only in the Premier League, in the world playing for Aston Villa what a privilege that is brilliant we're talking about that quote off air weren't we James yeah yeah it's uh, it's perfect isn't it it's like whatever happens happens today we're enjoying it and then we're sitting down tomorrow and we'll talk business so absolute perfect exactly well, I remember a quote from Stylian Petrov during our um, during our podcast telling me how great I was and how well respected <laughs> I was um, <laughs> probably, probably that one to be honest that's the one that's stuck in my mind the most last category and it's a perfect segue there that you've unintentionally mentioned Stan Petrov it was best podcast moment and this is very self-indulgent to sit here and go oh look at us how good we were but 2020 as much as it's been a terrible year for, for the world it's been a good year for Villa and it's been a good year for us I've enjoyed doing the podcast over the last 12 months and we've done a lot of good things we've grown much bigger than I thought we would in, the, in this first pretty much first, first 12 months um, I think we started on November 2019. So we've been doing it for just over a year now. You mentioned Stan Petrov there as being your favourite quote just because he was bigging you up for, for five minutes. Um, is it your best podcast moment of the year or is there something else that stands out of 12 months of videos? I had an email actually the other day, you know, like the Spotify wrapped thing when it tells you what songs you've listened to and how many people have, have you've streamed and that kind of thing. We had one for Claret and Blue and this is like a month old at this point. We said like, your viewers have watched 100,000 hours of your videos and you've had 50,000 this, you've had 100,000 this. It was like stats and figures. I'll put it up on screen for the YouTube audience that are watching. Uh, it's a month out of date now, but it's this massive list of data of people that have watched the podcast for the last 12 months. So the fact that people have supported us in the last 12 months means a lot to me and the work that we do. So that's a good moment in one sense. But I think the interviews that we've done with Petrov, Barry, Vyman, Larson, Gabby. I think that's what's been my favourite moment of 2020, getting to speak to these guys and getting fresh new stories out of them as well. I find it really, really difficult to narrow it down to one episode or, or one clip. I think it's been such um, such an eclectic mix of content and interviews and opinions and nonsense. Top of my head, just when you both drew the picture of Hercules, it just, it, and we put it out to Twitter to vote on it, it was that. <laughs> I liked when we got my um when we did the podcast with my lad and we were just kind of chatting, you know, bringing a little bit of a kind of the younger generation into it. Some there's been some wonderful stories. Vyman pretending he was a painter and decorator when he met his missus. Uh, Lee Henry walking Big Ron's little shih tzus around Bodymore Heath. Um, you know, Petrov I thought was was brilliant. Was like really really open and and really great. Um, even the post-match stuff, you know, people should, 
people by now should know who we are and and and, and what we are really you know if you want to <laughs> if you want incisive punditry then you go over to avfc Express. if you want uh, if you want us to just kind of really kind of get lost in the moment whether it's good bad or indifferent then I don't know. It's been, um, without it sounding like a, too much of a kind of message for for the, for the new year, it's been a real, uh, real exciting journey the last twelve months, and I think we've done, you know, what what we should be doing and what's expected of us, which is, you know, it's an entertainment industry, it's an obsession, it's it's something that people have a lot of passion for. Football, I mean, not Claret and Blue podcast. Uh, and we've tried to reflect that. We've tried to tell good stories. We've tried to be opinionated, and we've tried to have a laugh. Uh, so pinning it down to, to one moment I couldn't do it for me the moment would be it would genuinely be all the positive comments you had because I know we did joke on the, the Christmas special about some of the negative ones but in all honesty even though there are a few ones that do hit hard and there are a few ones that are like in bad faith and can be nasty the majority is, it, it is massively positive and it is always people feeding yeah. off you know stuff that's said and picking up on little in jokes and it is like being a part of a genuine community and i know and not a lot of people understand that claret and blue isn't our, our job it is part of our job but you know we all have job roles that are not devoted to this podcast so you know our, on our contracts it's not host a few episodes of claret and blue a week it's do all this claret and blue come, comes after and oh, i wish it was you know, <laughs> exactly but like it is being a big part of this community being leaders in this community and you know all the positive stuff that said it just keeps you going it's like we we have all well me and dan have done stuff outside of i guess the football industry and and that is that is it's incredibly hard but to be in it it's a different ball game and to kind of keep the standards high and keep pushing and you know be in charge of a big community that you know has has real weight to it it is scary. It's scary putting yourself out there. We, you know, with with the name of, I guess, Birmingham Live or whatever on it, and kind of trying to represent that. And then, I guess, uh, I don't know, it might change some people's minds or you know, um, make people happy. Yeah, it has been. It has been positive. It has been a massive. You know, all the comments we've had have been amazing and lovely. Few negative ones, but the the wave of posit- positivity has been pretty overwhelming. I mean, if you wanted to make Dan a present. Out of the positive comments, you need the you need a few more canvases. Yeah, I don't think I've got enough, enough printer ink, mate, to, for all the nice things about Dan Rollinson that I've read in our <laughs> comment sections in recent months. Yeah, what about you, Dan? Have we? What's your favourite? Yeah, I think I think the interviews are probably the, the highlight. I think when we've done, I mean, a little bit of a peek behind the curtain. Obviously, when we spoke to to Stephen Petrov, you you look at his story, and it's obviously one that's inspiring and, and should be told and, and retold over and over again. But you do look at somebody like that and think, I feel like I've heard everything from Stephen Petrov at this point that he's done since he's retired. He's, he's spoken a lot in, in to various media outlets over the years about his story, and you, you think we've got Petrov on Monday. How good will that be? But. I feel like we've heard it all before and it's good to get that story on the current movie podcast still regardless and I'm very grateful for everyone who spoke to us. But the fact that we can find out things like his favourite takeaway and what he's having for Christmas tells me that, that the current movie podcast offers something a bit different. I know that sounds stupid, but it's that we do things in our own way. I think that's my that, that, that's my highlight of the year that we don't conform to what a traditional podcast is. That If you and me are going to open a podcast where we'll just beat uh, whoever it was last week and you open it by how do you open a banana? It sounds stupid and people who are very passionate about football will be like, well, that's a load of nonsense. But that's what we do. That's what we've done for 13 months now. And people who watch our stuff and enjoy it, enjoy the thing that we've built so far. I mean, as much as I'm very quick to jump on Twitter and point out a negative comment to laugh at it and joke at it and say, this guy online is saying this about me. Someone says I've got a big nose. Someone says I'm boring. Someone says I'm whatever. Things like that don't bother me anyway. But like you said, 99.9% of the comments are lovely. They're very nice. It's just difficult to reply to them all because there's so many. It's easier to point out the bad than it is to highlight the good. Um, but I think the fact that we've grown in such a way over the last 12 months, that's been the highlight. And that as much as you say, this isn't our job, to a degree, obviously it is. We are doing this as part of our job. It never feels like work. And I think yeah. that's what the highlight is, that these are always fun to do, whether it's at 10 o'clock after a, a defeat or 9 o'clock and an early start and we're going to talk about some random thing that happened 10 years ago. It's always good fun, and I think that's my favourite part about it. I did like the half and half scarf video, though. <laughs> yes, that, yeah, and, exactly. that was good. I mean, again, that feels like three years ago. And the one, the one interview that that surprised me because 
not really a name, but I thought it was a really powerful interview with Stephen Cook. I thought that that showed yeah, that we yeah. don't always tell, we don't always tell the obvious stories, and we, you know, if it's Aston Villa, no matter what aspect of Aston Villa it is, if we think might we're not might not always be right, but if we think there's an interesting angle to tackle and to, to talk about then then we'll do it um no it's been it's been good fun i'm looking i'm looking forward to to the potential for us kind of in 2021 um whether we're allowed back in the same room or whether it's still doing it down the kind of um down the camera of a laptop uh that's been good fun so just thanks to everybody for for all the support that you've given us and for tolerating the terrible jokes um and for just giving us encouragement along the way. Happy New Year. I was going to say, Happy New Year. I think that's the perfect way to end, isn't it? Can I go and eat my yeah. cheese board now? Happy New Year. Enjoy the cheese board. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, up the villa. Up the villa.